Hey folks, take a listen to this from the great Thomas Sowell, one of the greatest thinkers of our time, and he nails a huge problem in today's society and economy. Check it out. Yeah, I, th- I think that uh, we're raising whole generations uh, who, 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 who regard facts as more or less optional. Um, you have kids in, the, in, the, in elementary school who are being urged to take stands on political issues, to write letters to congressmen and presidents about nuclear energy. And they're being taught that it's important to have views, and they're not being taught that it's important to know what you're talking about. It's important to hear the opposite viewpoint, and more important, to learn how to distinguish whether, why viewpoint A and viewpoint B are different and which one has the most evidence or logic behind it. They disregard that. They hear something, and they hear some rhetoric, and they run with it. I mean, boy, he is so spot on. And this is one of the reasons we're in the situation that we're in. Man, I wish he'd run for president. He'd definitely get my vote. What he said is why we are where we are as a country and an economy. People don't know the truth. They're being spun to fulfill a narrative that just isn't true. And they're starting this false narrative at a very, very young age in our school system. And by the way, this all ties in with what I want to talk about today, which is the economy and the new central bank digital currency or CBDC. And folks, this isn't necessarily a currency, although it does act like one. This is a surveillance tool. This is a way to monitor everything we do, what we buy, who we give money to, what we eat, how we travel, how much we travel, how much gas we consume, how much electricity we use, how much we cool or cool or heat our homes, and the list goes on. This digital currency is the ultimate goal with the end game being pure Marxism. And folks, if you don't think this is going to have an impact on your financial life, your pension, your 401k, your retirement, the value of your dollar, your spending power, and perhaps most importantly, your freedom, you really need to wake up. And folks, this is coming faster than you can possibly imagine. And I covered this a little bit in an earlier episode, but I want to take a deeper dive today because things are really, really ramping up. I also want to give an update on new developments on a few topics that we've discussed in prior episodes. We got another lightning round of stories that will make your head spin. And I'm going to try to get to as many as I can. And there are so many I want to share. And of course, our sound bite of the week. And this one is great and so, so revealing. Folks, here we go. If you have concerns about your financial future, let's be honest, the world shapes your wallet. We're taking you behind the scenes to look at what's really happening in the real world. Inform, prepare, and empower. This is the Full Disclosure Podcast with your host, John McGregor. All right, we've got a lot to dive into, so let's get into it. Thanks again for all your comments and your feedback. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And thanks for sharing the show with your friends, family, and colleagues. It really means a lot, and it does a lot for our cause, right? Don't forget to hit subscribe and keep sharing this. And by the way, you don't want to miss next week for sure. And also, I've lined up some interviews with some very, very high-powered individuals that you don't want to miss, so stay tuned for that. I also mentioned I finally finished my free wealth guide titled The Ultimate Guide to Wealth, How to Finally Achieve Financial Independence and Live Life on Your Own Terms. And we saw a huge surge of downloads from last week's show. It's really a compilation of my 28 years of helping individuals and businesses and inspiring entrepreneurs. So I hope you enjoy it. And please let me know your thoughts if you did happen to pick it up. would love, love to get your feedback. And by the way, for those who haven't done so, you can find it on my website. Again, it's called The Ultimate Guide to Wealth, How to Finally Achieve Financial Independence and Live Life on Your Own Terms. So I want to make a couple of comments from previous topics that we've covered that have generated quite a buzz in the comments section and from the emails I'm receiving. And by the way, if you want to send me a direct message or ask me a question, feel free to do so at hello at johnmcgregor.net. And that's mcgregor, M-A-C-G-R-E-G-O-R.net. And this first one is on the 401k. And look, I understand a lot of people don't like the 401k, but instead of attacking it, let's come up with a solution, right? And I also know firsthand a lot of people don't like it because that's what they're being told to believe. But right now, folks, it's the only game in town, pretty much for a majority of people. And like I said, most people are going to be employees for the rest of their lives. That's just a fact. I mean, what are these people going to do? What's their retirement plan if there wasn't a 401k? 
And look, most people who hate the 401k have never had to sit across a desk from someone 65 years old who hasn't put anything away. I've sat through hundreds, if not thousands of those meetings and it's awful. And I hate having those conversations with people because I hate having to tell somebody who's worked their tail off for 30 or 35 years that they can't retire and they have to keep working. So I don't think those people who attack the 401k really understand what's going on in the real world with real life people. And by the way, I've never heard anybody say to me, gee, John, I wish I put less into my 401k. In fact, it's always the opposite when they say, boy, I wish I put more and I wish I started earlier. And by the way, on a side note, Bitcoin is not the answer for retirement. I get that question all the time. I do want to give a shout out to a fellow certified financial planner at Truth9781. Thanks for your comment. And I like his advice, but I would add a caveat to it. He suggested using, or I, was, I should say funding the 401k up until the employer match, uh, the employer match limit, and then open up a Roth IRA and fill that bucket up next. And that's sound advice. I like that. And the beauty of the Roth IRA is that although you don't get a tax break when you put money in or contribute money, but it does grow tax free. When that, when that account grows in size 20, 30, or 40 years, that money comes out tax free. But here's my caveat. With a Roth, you could only put away $6,500 a year or $7,500 if you're age 50 or over. So again, what I would do is contribute up to the 401k match and then start contributing to your Roth IRA up until you max that out. Then if you still have funds available to put away, go back to the 401k and continue to fill that bucket up as well. Now, having said all of that, you still want to make sure you have, mo you have money outside of your retirement plans that you can access if you need to. And that, and that includes at least a three-month emergency fund if for whatever reason you lose your job or you can no longer work. Again, at least a minimum of three months an emergency fund, ideally six months. But again, thanks for that comment. I really, I really like that. So I'm hearing all this nonsense that inflation is over. I mean, talk about a gaslighting. Paul Krugman, the distinguished, in quotes, professor of economics at the University of New York and a columnist, columnist, I can never say the word, for the New York Times, which will tell you everything about his thinking. He actually won a Nobel Prize in economic science. And folks, this guy, this guy, Paul Krugman, the distinguished professor, has been wrong on every single economic prediction and policy for the past 40 years. And they continue to put him out there on TV. It's just because he follows the narrative and, and he says what they want them to say. He said, the Fed is winning the war on inflation and we are in a Goldilocks economic situation. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable that someone can simply lie so blatantly about this economy. And here's his direct quote. The Fed is winning its war on inflation and doing so faster and more easier, easily than most observers expected, end quote. And then, of course, he said this. He claimed, get this, and this will tell you everything. He said this, that the largest impact felt by inflation was not the economic effect, but the failure to, here it comes, pass meaningful climate change reform. There you go, folks. It's climate change. Every problem in society is due to climate change. My lower back pain is all about climate change. It's not my workouts. It's not all the gardening and landscaping I do. It's climate change. Folks, this is all about protecting the narrative. That's what this whole thing is all about, protecting the narrative. And all of this ties back, all of this ties back to digital currency that I'm going to discuss in just a moment. I am now back to paying over $5.50 per gallon for gasoline. And I'm afraid that price is only going higher. Watch out. As I said last week, Biden just canceled drilling rights for $1 million prime oil acres in Alaska. And overall, he's canceled 13 million acres of land for drilling throughout the U.S. 13 million acres, hands off to drilling. And he's basically rescinded every single drilling contract from the previous administration. And get this, now the U.S. government is proposing to ban mining and oil drilling in New Mexico for the next 50 years. Look, with Saudi Arabia cutting output, Biden strangling domestic oil production, and now we have a record demand for fuel, crude prices are up 26% this quarter alone. 26% this quarter alone. 
and it won't be long before we hit $100 per barrel for oil. And when you factor basically every product that's made from fertilizer to sneakers, from the airline industry to manufacturers, all of these require a lot of fuel. These fuel costs are going to wreak havoc and further increase, increase inflation even more. And I would do yourself a favor and fill up your car today because those prices are going to skyrocket very, very soon. And on another note, I got to talk about electric vehicles. I mean, this massive push for electric vehicles, this mandate is going to require somewhere near 60% of all vehicles manufactured by 2030 to be electric. I mean, that's the mandate here in California and in many other states across the country. And this is sweeping across the globe as well. This has nothing to do with the environment. Let's just be honest here. This push is going to cripple the auto industry and, of course, us, the consumers, particularly the middle class and the lower income class. But look, this push is not about electric cars. It's about eliminating cars. Let's just, let's just be honest here. Because if their push, if their push was about the environment, you would have to look at the environmental damage that electric cars create. I mean, it's absolutely devastating what this electric vehicle push is doing to the world's environment. And you can't recycle this stuff. Those batteries are non-recyclable. And by the way, in the end, it's, I believe, the, uh, the government will likely end up owning most of the charging stations or a big portion of them, which is just like the digital currency that will just give them more control of our lives. And we can't ignore the mining for lithium and other precious metals is destroying the planet and people's lives. And by the way, it's going to destroy the trucking industry as well as they're being mandated to very quickly adopt electric trucks. I'm sorry, I'm just on a rant today. I am really, really fired up. And get this, here's some scary stats. A new clean diesel long haul tractor typically costs in the range of $180,000 to $200,000. Let me say that again. A new clean diesel long haul tractor typically costs in the range of $180,000 to $200,000. But a comparable a comparable electric long haul tractor, an electric long haul tractor costs upwards of 480,000. That's a $300,000 upcharge from the clean diesel long haul trucker. And I saw this. This is mind blowing. It takes about 10 hours to charge an electric truck. 10 hours, folks. And that gives it a range of 150 to 300 miles. A normal diesel-powered truck has the capacity with a full tank of gas to go between 1,600 and 1,800 miles. So yeah, it's unbelievable. And then, of course, my wonderful state of California is requiring that 55% of vans and small trucks, 75% of buses and large trucks, and 40% of tractor trailers must be fully electric by 2035. And lastly, by 2045, gas and diesel trucks will be banned from being sold in California. 2035 and 2045, that's not too far from now. All under the hoax of climate change, which it is, folks. Folks, all of this is going to have a crippling effect on our financial lives and our futures. And sadly, I think that's the goal. You know, on a personal note, on Sundays, my wife and I go to breakfast after church, which is really the only day I eat breakfast, right? I usually skip and just have lunch. And, by, and then by 11 a.m. on a Sunday, I'm outside uh, doing yard work and, and in my garden. And by 2 o'clock, I'm typically getting a little hungry, but not enough for a full lunch. And that's sort of my cheat date, right? Cheat day, not date. Cheat day. So I went over to Burger King, and I got a small Whopper Jr., right? And a tiny small fries. I mean, these are tiny. And it was $8. No drink. Just a small one meat patty burger on a tiny bun and small fries. $8. I mean, it's costing a family of four $50 to eat dinner at McDonald's, and it's just getting crazy. And, and on that note, I just read this. The wonderful California governor, Gavin Newsom, passed a state law establishing a state council with an open-ended authority to set wages and benefits and working conditions for fast food shops. This new bill, folks, gives Newsom sweeping powers to regulate the fast food industry. And here's what it does. It raises the minimum wage to $20 an hour from the statewide $16 minimum for all other industries. So in, in essence, 
What that means is $20 an hour will become the state's de facto minimum wage, which will destroy small businesses and the economy here in California, which he's already done. And nearly 8 million workers in the state earn less than $20 an hour. And now they're all going to get a huge raise because all businesses now will have to compete with this in order to retain and hire new employees. But here's where they never look at consequences to, to their feel-good policies. All these things, they only implement things that feel good, but they never ask, do they do good? And a study I just read an Oxford by, a, uh, by Oxford Economics estimated that the new $20 minimum wage will lead to a loss of 5,100 fast food jobs and more than 300 establishments in California. That's just the fast food industry, folks. Folks, a job at McDonald's is not supposed to be a career move. It's a job mostly for young individuals who's, who are just starting out. They want to get some work experience and make a little money during the summers, right? These jobs aren't, aren't meant to be a lifelong career move. And now at $20 an hour, what do you think that's going to do to prices at these establishments? All that's going to happen, all that's going to happen as a result of this is that businesses are going to eliminate jobs, decrease the number of hours employees can work, and they're going to force these fast food businesses and other businesses or industries to automate eliminating even more jobs. I mean... It's just so unbelievable how stupid these people are and how obvious it is that they don't care about the economy and they certainly don't care about you and me. All they care about is maintaining power and control by paying for votes. Long-term consequences are never, ever factored in. All right, this next update is from last week's episode where I said just last Friday, seven days ago, that in a few months, we will hit $33 trillion in debt. Well, I was off by a wide margin because five days later, after I said that, we hit $33 trillion. Folks, this is unsustainable. $33 trillion of debt at 5% at a 5% interest rate, that's more than $1.65 trillion per year just in interest expenses. That's twice the size of our military and defense spending, just in interest on our debt. And that debt is not slowing down at all. And sadly, sadly, I know most people just shrug their shoulders because they think it doesn't affect them. I'm telling you, you must pay attention to this. And we all must tell other people as well. That's our responsibility because most people have no idea of what's really going, going on in our economy until it's too late. And here's where the rubber meets the road. All of this is why we're seeing the poverty rate increase for the first time in 13 years. That's right, poverty is rising for the first time in 13 years. I mean, you have to admit it, that's Bidenomics, folks, which is a perfect storm of spending, rising debt, and high inflation. Bidenomics, perfect. And by the way, just as a spoiler alert for those who think the Inflation Reduction Act actually reduced inflation, which I know you guys don't believe that, but sadly, many other many people do. In fact, what the, reflection, what the Inflation Reduction Act did was massive damage to the economy, and the proof is in the numbers. Don't take my opinion, it's in the numbers. And when you look at the massive regulatory policies that have been implemented in the last two years, this regulatory thrust has acted as a de facto tax that hurt poor families more than any other income group. And if you look at the chart, and for those just listening, I'll explain it. And by the way, this study was done by two senior policy economic experts who recently testified in Congress. And this chart shows that the bottom income quintile will pay approximately 15% of their household income due to labor regulations, consumer regulations, and oil and gas regulations. 15% of their income for these new regulations that have been implemented over the last two years. And as you go up the household income quintile, in other words, as you go up to higher income brackets, the cost burden continues to go down. And when you get to the top income quintile, the cost of all these regulations as a percentage of their household income, in other words, the rich is only about 2.2%. So again, the poor and the middle class get the shaft once again. All right. Next quick update is on Iran. We talked about this last week. The, the Iran hostage swap is now official. They gave us five hostages. 
We gave them five hostages, but on top of that, we threw in $6 billion as a thank you. Basically, $1.2 billion per hostage. I mean, how's that for a fair trade? I mean, that's, that's some really great negotiating, guys. And the administration says this with a straight face at a press conference, that this money we gave Iran is purely for humanitarian aid and not for military or nuclear weapons. <laughs> yeah, right. And just a day or two later, after the deal was done, Iran has now shut down United Nations nuclear weapon inspectors. Hmm. Interesting, right? No more nuclear weapon inspectors. You can't see what we're doing with your $6 billion and all the other money we've given them in prior administrations. So where do you think that $6 billion is going, right? To build nuclear bombs and weapons or for blankets and baby formula? <laughs> well, I think, the, I think this is a pretty obvious answer to that question. And lastly, the last update from the previous episode is about the migrant crisis. And now New York City who originally declared themselves as a sanctuary city has now reversed course and have deemed this emergence have deemed this as an emergency crisis as over 110,000 migrants have landed in New York City. So take a wild guess what the solution is. What the solution is that they want to do that the socialists in charge want to implement. That's right, time to implement a migrant tax on the tax paying residents of New York City. Senator Julius Salazar, who represents Brooklyn and other political leaders, said, quote, we should increase taxes because it's economically just policy to offset all costs for our state to function, end quote. And then, of course, she dribbles on that the rich don't pay their fair share, right? Of course, she had to throw that in. Oh, in addition to this migrant tax, and, and, and by the way, from what I see, these migrants have it pretty good, right? Free housing and nice hotels, uh, cell phones, food, medical services, education, laundry services. That's right. They're getting laundry services. I mean, the word is out in the migrant community to get to uh, get to New York as quickly as possible. But in the midst of all of this, the New York City mayor, Eric Adams, said that this influx of, of thousands of migrants will bring a financial tsunami to its city. So get this one. Amongst this financial tsunami, right, and crime at record levels, the city council is planning a series of measures to remove statues of major historical figures like George Washington and Christopher Columbus, and then they want to create a reparations tax force. Statutes, statues, and reparations. That's where their focus is. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating that they have the, the cojones, right, to bring this stuff up now, given the fact that New York is being run into the ground. But on the other hand, it's all strategic, right? They won't solve the migrant problem and they won't address the real reason behind it because it goes against the narrative. So they need another grievance as a deflection from real problems they refuse to solve. And lastly, on the subject of migration, I just saw, get this, that we've got more people on the terrorist watch list that crossed our border in February, just in February, more terrorists than all terrorists over the last four years. Terrorists crossing into our country. Just in February alone, more terrorists than all terrorists in the last four years. I mean, this is scary, folks, and this is just getting out of control and it's impacting all of our lives and especially our financial future. All right, now let's shift gears. Let's get back to central bank digital currency, otherwise known as the CBDC. And by the way, all this stuff I discuss and have discussed, it's all interconnected. And, and folks, this stuff is coming pretty quick. As I said earlier, this digital currency will give the federal government the ability to surveil Americans' transactions and restrict them from politically unpopular activities. This is nothing more than a CCP-style surveillance tool that would undermine our way of life, which is their ultimate dream. This is a primary reason you never hear this administration or Hollywood or academia criticize China and their communist system because they envy them. That's the system they want. And I'm telling you, the climate hysteria will only grow louder because that's their justification for pushing all of this. Listen to the leading World Economic Forum advisor, Yuval Harari. It's spooky. It's not an extremely deadly virus. It's not the Black Death and look what it's doing to the world. So now just try to think what will be the implications of a much bigger 
a problem like climate change. Also, conceptually, it shows that, um, and here I completely agree with you, Ratko, that it shows you that you can change things on a massive scale. That, um, and again, you can stop all flights. You can lock down entire countries. You can actually do that. And uh, life goes on in some way. And this, I would say, may make us more open to radical ideas about how to deal also with climate change. No, life doesn't go on. And this doesn't make us more open to your radical ideas. I mean, this is the authoritarian agenda. See how they're tying climate change to push this, push this radical agenda, which includes their end goal, which is this new digital currency. And this is Larry Fink, who heads up BlackRock, which is one of the largest, uh, world's largest fund managers. And he says they need to be able to control behavior because that's the only way to save the planet. Here's Larry Fink. Well, behaviors are going to have to change, and this is one thing we're, going to, we're asking companies. Uh, you have to force behaviors, and at BlackRock, we are forcing behaviors. We, we added four more points in terms of diverse uh, employment this year. And it, if it, it, you know, what we are doing internally is if you don't achieve these levels of impact, it, your compensation could be impacted, okay? We're doing the same thing. And so it's just, it, you have to force behaviors. Force behaviors or you will be impacted. I mean, this guy is extremely dangerous to us all. And again, how do you control behavior? You do it by controlling their wallet. And we're seeing this around the world. As 130 countries, last I've seen, worldwide are actively researching and launching some form of a digital currency, a centralized digital currency. And we've talked about the new currency, right, called BRICS, which stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, which is really a digital currency backed by gold that more and more countries are showing a lot of interest in, which is meant to replace the U.S. dollar. Folks, this is happening very, very quickly. I mean, have you noticed more and more retailers are not accepting cash? I mean, I'm seeing this all the time. And our Fed has already announced a digital currency pilot program. So this thing is starting to build momentum. And by the way, the supporters of the CBDC say, of course, it's in our best interest, right? They're just trying to sell us on this thing. They're saying it's going to be, it's going to make banking easier and cheaper and faster and more accessible for everyone, blah, 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 blah. And how do they implement this? Check it out. Todd Westby might just have a hand in shaping the future. The CEO of vending machine maker Three Square Market literally opening doors with automation that's turning some workers into high-tech machines of sorts. This is a lot more than just some sort of novelty to you. It is. It's reality. With all of the interest we've seen in it, I can tell this is definitely the future. By injecting a rice-sized microchip into a willing employee's hand, all kinds of data can be programmed into them, from driver's licenses and medical ID cards to logging onto computers. You have to hold it up to something such as this. Even purchasing snacks in the company break room. More than 50 employees have volunteered. How much did that hurt? Didn't really hurt a lot. A third holding off for now. It kind of freaks me out a little bit. Some experts suggest caution. Among the concerns, ID theft, health, and whether the chips can be tracked by GPS. Don't worry, it's for the greater good. The bottom line, this digital currency would provide countless opportunities for the government to control citizens' financial activities. And all it would take is for the president to announce some sort of crisis, particularly a climate crisis, right? And boom. Your access to a gas pump is shut off. Imagine they announce, based on some self-indulgent study or some research report, that cows are destroying the planet. Boom, there goes your access to meat. Actually, wait a minute. Haven't they already done that? Check this out. We need to eat less meat. We need to, to stop land being used for cattle and growing grain for the billions of animals that we keep in our intensive farms. And then finally, we cannot, we cannot hide away from human population growth because, you know, it underlies so many of the other problems. All these things we talk about wouldn't be a problem if there, were, if there was the size of population that there was 500 years ago. I mean, it's unbelievable what they're even saying out loud now. You see what I mean? I mean, this is crazy. And you know what? For what she just said, I'm having a steak tonight and a big baked potato. 
So let's say you're protesting the government peacefully, right? Because we all have a right to protest, right? Well, we used to. Will the government be able to freeze your assets? Of course they can. That's just what Justin Trudeau did in Canada when the truckers protested. But don't worry, it's for the greater good. How about interest rates? A CBDC would allow policymakers to set negative interest rates, which would result in people losing money stored in their digital wallet. And why would they do that? To encourage us to spend our money. As I talked about, by programming a CBDC, money can be precisely targeted for what people can and can't own and what people, what people can and can't do. And by the way, just think of the cyber risk of a centralized digital currency. Very, very scary. All right, folks, we got to get to the lightning round. And I don't think I'm going to get to as many stories as I wanted to. And I apologize for that. But this one's out of Illinois. With crime at an all-time high, roughly 40 people are shot and 12 are killed every single weekend just in Chicago. The leaders of Chicago, are, or I should say the leaders in Illinois, have decided to end cash bail. And this is rolled out, get this, under the Safety Act. You got to love these names they give them. The stories I hear of crime in Chicago are unbelievable. It's out of control there. And by eliminating cash bail and letting criminals out after their crime, this is only going to encourage more of it. And the law in question passed in 2022 with Governor J.B. Pritzker. He signed it. And according to, the, to an article, it will free from jail thousands of suspects accused of second-degree murder, kidnapping, burglary, robbery, and other violent crimes. I mean, it's just another reason for more retailers and businesses, business owners to close shop and move out of Illinois. I mean, it's such a shame for such an amazing city. It's actually my, well, it was my favorite city. And the people in charge are allowing this. Actually, they're encouraging its, destru its destruction. And it just shows you how bad policies, weak policies, can, it, can destroy economies and hurt people financially. And get this, in Chicago, we're seeing grocery stores like Walmart and Whole Foods close their stores in the city because of crime and shoplifting. So the mayor of Chicago has wisely announced that they're going to increase police patrol and enforce crime. I'm just kidding. Instead, he's now exploring a city-owned grocery store as a means of promoting equitable access to food. Huh? How about fixing the crime problem? Why don't we just start there first before you open a government-run grocery store that's going to operate as well as the DMV, right? And even the CEO of Walmart warned, that it's, its stores across the country, not just in Illinois, but across the country are grappling with a tremendous amount of shoplifting to agree that, quote, if it's not corrected over time, prices will be higher and stores will close. Folks, that is exactly what I'm trying to show you here with this show, that these policies that these politicians implement have far reaching consequences than just the policy itself. And the consequences trickle down into all aspects of our life particularly our financial life, even if it's from a state you don't live in. So what the CEO of Walmart is saying is that this massive crime wave, the shoplifting that's going across the country in all of his stores is going to have a direct cause on the price of their products. It's unbelievable. Folks, I really apologize. We are out of time. I got to wrap up just two months to cover in a short period of time. So let's wrap up with this, the sound clip of the week. And this is a great clip. And this is on CNN of all places. And you know it's bad when CNN starts reporting the truth and calling you out. This is a, this is a guy named Cardona. He's the education secretary dodging and weaving and sweating over who's going to pay for the student loan forgiveness. And this is a very good question. Who's going to pay it? Well, we know the answer. We are. Check it out. I do appreciate that. But who's paying for that cost? Well, as I said before, the deficit reduction uh, is creating space for uh, policies that open the door right. to access. But let me let me shift a bit I, to I just want to understand. I do. I do. I want to hear from them. I want to. Big issue. I want to hear about that. But I also just want to sure. level with the American people. That cost is federal government pays for it. Taxpayers. Right. It's part of the uh, president's uh, plan, which also includes deficit reductions. You can't discuss what uh, the costs are without talking about how 
the deficit has been reduced. Yeah. And what we're hearing from the American people who are drowning in debt mm -hmm. and can't buy a home and at the economy because of college costs. Yeah, I totally understand that. I'll also uh, note that the federal budget deficit is now expected to balloon to two trillion dollars for the fiscal year of 2023. I mean, his, his response sounds something like this. <laughs> Perfect. That's perfect. That's exactly what he said. Welcome to the spin zone, right? I mean, what a clown. All right, folks, great being with you. You don't want to miss next week and certainly future episodes where I'm interviewing some very high-powered people, very interesting conversations. So make sure you hit subscribe, and we'd love to hear your thoughts or comments in the chat. Don't forget, my new wealth guide is available on my website. The PDF's free, and I, I even did an audio version, which I think is around 7 bucks. Have a great weekend. Aloha. Take care. Thanks for listening and supporting Full Disclosure. If you like this episode, remember to like and subscribe and follow Full Disclosure. To make a better financial plan for your future, join our Cashflow Bootcamp, where John shows you a safe and smart way to turn your investments into a steady income stream in a fraction of your time. Learn to make money in any market. Until next time.